Okay, we are going live in five, four, three. Good evening and good afternoon from whatever part of the world you are in. This is uh, IKRPP TV Talk Radio. This is the 20, 20th of the 10th, 2015, and I'm your host, David C., presenting the show. I welcome you to the show, and yet again, as I remind you, this is an amateur zone. I'm an amateur, not a professional. We're going to read some news articles and I will continue. As I said in my previous broadcast yesterday, that I am actually going through a list uh, uh, of uh, buzzwords or a glossary of terms for the New World Order. Uh, the reason why I'm doing this is for those people who know very little about the New World Order, have heard these words and probably know very little about them. I'm giving you just a very simple brief who's who, what's what, um, for dummies. It's basically the New World Order for dummies. But before I do that, I get on to reading some news, and I've got some news articles to read. Um, as per usual, I like reading the news, um, and I like to present the news as best as I can. Um, the first one, this article. And by the way, you'll have to forgive me, I have to take these glasses off to read with reading glasses and then put these on so I can see the TV. Okay, first article on the agenda today. This inter uh, this article comes to you from uh, the Conspiracy Club. Okay, it's interesting. A 12-year-old uh, girl has discovered uh, that all but one of the US presidents are related to each other. Now, 12 year old uh, Bridge Anne d'Avion made an effort to trace back her genealogy, uh, genealogical roots uh, in France and decided to branch out uh, to a different kind of family tree, searching through over 500 names and completing one of the greatest discoveries in genealogical history. Um, somehow this genius young lady managed to complete uh, what even the greatest genealogical groups have not yet proved, that all the presidents trace back to one British king, uh, King John Lac Lacland Plantogenet. Plantogenet, by the way, is a French uh, lineage. Um, King Richard the Lionheart was a Plantogenet. And, of course, obviously, everybody knows about the Battle of Az Azincourt. As the French pronounce it, we call it Agincourt. I prefer to give it the... Um, uh, I prefer to give it the... Uh, um, the French name, because that's exactly what it is. It was The Battle of a uh, Agincourt was fought on France, French soil. Not far from a little town called Saint-Omer uh, Saint in northern France, near uh, near Calais. Well, she's a track this Now, there's a lot of people... I'm going to share this with you. There's a lot of people who have, have, who have made alleged claims that uh, virtually every single major world leader, inventor, musician, creator, architect, uh, scientist that are written in our history books are put there for a reason and that they are all connected to these kind of bloodline families. It'd be interesting to find out, wouldn't it? Maybe one, maybe one of you geniuses out there can figure out exactly who belongs to who uh, and who's telling each other uh, who, in which direction the human race and species should go. Hmm. Anyway, she's a very, very clever girl, from what I can see. Uh, I'll show you a picture of her. And of the map that she's got. That's a picture of her. And that's the chart that she has. I will post this article on uh, the comments below the YouTube upload at the end of the show. Okay, next article. This article comes to you uh, courtesy of Infowars.com. Previously, Infowars.com used to be my favourite show, but I think that uh, Infowars has been um, has been so well known now. Uh, its lead host, uh, Alex Jones, who started well, about 20 years ago now, and he started in a very local small studio, 
and has managed to um, in many cases uh, has managed to uh, um, to carve out quite a niche uh, he went from a, a, a very small show and now currently he's running in around about 50 million audience he actually is um, I believe the uh, in the top five ranking uh, alternative media journalists out there and when I say alternative media it's almost as if everywhere you go you hit Alex Jones he seems to get everywhere um but he has got a is I've printed out a couple of reports from his website he's he does manage to collect he's a bit similar to drudge report in that uh, he does collect quite a lot of data and quite a lot of news items um some of them are written by uh, his in-house journalists and some of them are taken from uh other newspapers and a write up from that other newspapers now when you have um a newspaper that already has digested in, uh, news coming in from whatever source. That's digested news, and when that gets passed over to the alternative media, then it's second, uh, it's second degree digested source, not quite the same. But I'll read you uh, the remarks here. The headlines for this one is from the Infowars, uh, written by Kurt Nemo or Nemo. Infowars.com. Sweden on the verge of collapse as illegal immigrants surge into the country. I think that I've been talking about this now on and off since I started my show about last week. And it's going to be a hot button issue many times. This immigrant issue is really, really... It's similar to what's happening in the Middle East when you say that you'll pick up a newspaper and you'll see the Middle East in flames and you see things happening in Jerusalem for those people who are in touch with what's happening in Jerusalem and in Israel will know that it's undergoing uh, what has now been uh, called or so-called uh, uh, Third Intifada. Well, the immigrant situation in Europe is set to do pretty much the same. What we're having here in the uh, in Europe is because of the the surge of immigrants, this is making the natives restless. And of course it will. Um, if you happen to be a lazy person in your own country and indigenous and you find somebody taking over jobs that you wish you had but you're too lazy to go and get, you'll find a lot of people are like that. They'll, of course, complain bitterly about the immigrant situation. Now, there are legitimate immigrants and people who are legitimately um, uh, desiring to, uh, to seek uh, uh, asylum from socially aggressive countries that they've come from, politically aggressive countries and countries where basically they're at war, really. But the problem is that these immigrants are bringing in an awful lot of other stuff that we don't want. And the other issue as well is that there's been reports, and I've seen some reports of this, okay? I'll read a bit of this article in a minute, but uh, I'm going to give my take on... on what I've seen happening from reports on Facebook. There have been some video footage. Um, whether these video footages are accurately uh, taken and documented from the actual immigrants uh, on march into Europe seeking asylum, or whether it's a manufactured event, I don't know. Uh, but there are some video footages that have been uh, floating around uh, the Facebook and social media sites of late and recent that shows groups, massive amounts of immigrants that um, that are actually seeking asylum coming into Europe. And these immigrants are all males. Now, when I see a group of people all males seeking asylum in another country and they're coming from a country that allegedly is at war and it's all males i don't see a woman there i don't see women and children generally speaking when people are seeking asylum abroad uh, and they're seeking asylum from the country they're coming from and they're bringing in all their mates generally speaking there tends to be a lot of women and children, and women and children tend to be the first wave of immigrants that come in. But I'm going to read a couple of read a couple of sentences from this. Um, Sweden proudly dubbed the uh, um, the great humanitarian power by its ex, uh, ex Prime Minister Frederick Reinfeld uh, is on the verge of collapse. The financial consequences of the of the West 
and above all Sweden's immigration policy is that the economic will uh, uh, the economy will collapse because who uh, who is going to pay for all uh, for it all? The economic uh, breakdowns once they happen always happen very fast. Uh, warns Danish historian Lars Hedgard. Uh, apparently, th- this actually does happen uh, in a lot of countries. Uh, it has been documented. Um, the problem is that I don't know whether this is uh, a scare tactic. Uh, we'll have to see. All we can do is um, watch this space. Now, here's another article yet again posted from Infowars.com. It actually is a, a second deg- a, a second degree story in that it has been already digested by the Daily Mail because the original source of this story was the Daily Mail and the Daily Mail from the 19th, which is yesterday. The article reads, Family fury over uh, over Blair's Iraq war lie. Smoking gun memo reveals he backed Bush 12 months before the conflict. I presume this is Gulf War Two. I am presuming this is Gulf War Two. Relatives of those who died in action uh, uh, hit out at the treachery and deceit used by the former PM Tony Blair. Oh my goodness, Tony Blair. I have words to say about Tony Blair. Uh, Family of troops killed in Iraq last night uh, reacted with fury to revelations that Tony Blair supported the US over the 2003 war a, a year before the first bombs fell. A leaked White House memo from March 2002 tells George Bush that Blair will be with us a full 12 months ahead of the conflict. Now, much has been said about the Gulf War, particularly the so-called sexed up, allegedly so-called sexed up document that uh, uh, that was port- uh, uh, that was uh, bantered around politics to claim that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. One thing I noticed about well, about uh, eight or nine months before Gulf War Two, one thing I noticed, and I heard a report, and I'm going to have to find a source for that one, that uh, uh, the U.S. sold an immense amount of gold. Now, um, gold is usually a, 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 an economic indicator species. Well, what I mean by that is that in, in, in natural biology and in eco-science, they try to determine the health of the ecosystem by looking at key indicator species. If they're present, then it's healthy, or if they're not, it's not healthy. Uh, in the eco-science, uh, they usually tend to say that the bees are a key indicator species to the health of the natural f- uh, fl- uh, flora and fauna, because essentially the bees cross-pollinate, and by pollination it means that not only do the flowers get pollinated, it also means crops get pollinated, which means that they get germinated so that they can produce food and we can eat. Mm, okay, Einstein has once made a statement that uh, he believes that if, when the bees die. Man has only but, uh, was it three or four or five months to go before they end up starving to death because the food crops won't be there? Maybe three years. I don't know what the actual time is. But uh, the bees are a key indicator species. Well, gold is uh, to money what the bees are to the natural flora and fauna. Gold is a key indicator species. When gold is being moved around the world, okay, it means that the people who are selling the gold are raising money for something, okay? Now, they could be raising money for um, for, uh, for printing more fiat currency uh, because the economy needs to be inflated a bit because a bubble is closing in. Uh, they might be uh, selling gold uh, to recruit their losses or underwrite certain insurance debts which haven't been... Uh, fully reconciled or have not been able to be recovered because they're classed as bad debt. That's one of the things. My suspicion is that when when you when a country sells an awful lot of gold and then suddenly a war happens, I'm going to put two and two together and come up with four in that one. Rightly or wrongly, rightly or wrongly, correctly or erroneously, come up with four. 
and uh, and state I think that the intention of selling the gold was to raise money for a war chest they were getting ready that they were going to need a little extra cash to push the incentive and push the agenda forward to make sure that it sealed the deal and had the necessary military equipment in readiness to a war so when you have a report like this, a family fury over, uh, um, over Blair's Iraq war lie, when you're selling war, um, yet again, I, remember, uh, I, rem I remind you of the first show that I did uh, on K IKRRP TV Talk Radio when I discussed the issue with Noam Chomsky about the issue of manufacturing consent. I'm going to give you a quote, uh, a little story that's kind of linked to this, and it's a story that went on just before World War I. And it's to do with the famous uh, British writer, Rudyard Kipling, who was a Mason, I believe. Now, Rudyard Kipling believed that World War I was a just and noble war. Okay? He believed that it was a just and noble war. Now, he had a son who couldn't get into the army. They couldn't place him in the military because he had medical problems. OK, there were medical conditions that precluded him entering into the military, whether it be the army or the pre the precursor to the RAF or the Navy. So what Roger, because Roger Kipling believed that it was a noble uh, war, he also believed that he wanted uh, to show that it was a noble war. And he pulled every string behind uh, uh, the scenes to get his son into uh, the battlefield. Well... The strings were pulled and his son went off to training. He was accepted into the army. He went off to the Somme and within a week he was killed. Shot dead in the heat of conflict. In a war that was called the Great War, the so-called war to end all wars. Roger Kipling did a bit of research after this because he was shocked and he was mortified about what had actually happened. This is the quote I'm going to give you. He found out that the war, World War I war, was essentially a manufactured event. And he realised that the strings that had been pulled because he was a, a mason and he had inside info on the deals that took place and the events leading up to World War I, he decided to make a statement and this was published uh, in the Times of its day, I'm not sure which year, which month, but it was published in the Times, the London Times, and this is a statement he made. I believe it's his greatest quote. And here's his quote. If anyone died when somebody should ask you, it's because our fathers lied, should anybody ask you. That's an interesting quote, don't you think? Um, so he knew that World War One was a lie. Now people are waking up and realizing that Gulf War One, as well as Gulf War Two, were lies. The problem is the media always spin it and make sure that people don't wake up to the reality of what's going on. And for those who do, they tend to marginalize you and put you in the category of conspiracy theorist. Yes. I've got another one for that one. Conspiracy theorist. You may not hear this, but... There you are. A bullshit button. Conspiracy theorist, yes, of course. Now, the next article. This article was um, was uh, posted onto the uh, Newscom uh, reader. Which actually, yet again, is a digested story that's passed out, but um, it has made uh, uh, it has made a billing in the Infowars. But I didn't get it from the Infowars; it was actually got from and passed through from the BBC News Desk. And uh, this one is the uh, Saudi prince avoids charges over alleged sex assaults in uh, in LA. Los Angeles prosecutors say that they will not press charges against the Saudi prince accused of sexual assault. Majid Abdul Ale Sawad, 28, was arrested last month on sex charges. Isn't that interesting? 
Okay, isn't that interesting? You will find there's probably a reason why he's not going to be charged. He's a Saudi prince. Uh, Saudi is where the West, particularly America, has a, an enormous oil agreement with. Gold, oil, drugs. That's their God. Make no bones about it. It's not the God of the Bible, not the Jehovah. Their God is gold, oil and drugs. Well, this one here is an article that speaks volumes about the American judiciary and the American law enforcement when they will not press charges because of alleged sex assault uh, a case involving a Saudi prince. Well, of course, they're going to cover that because to do that means that there, well, that would create an international incident between the U.S., and the Saudi Arabia and would definitely, definitely soil the Saudi-American relations uh, quite some way. I think yet again, smacks of insider trading, really. OK, next one. This is an article um, posted in the journal IE. This is an Irish uh, newspaper. Um, I keep an, abreast of Irish Irish matters, uh, being as it is that I live in uh, the UK. Our family um, uh, were some members of my family were involved in the troubles way back in the late seventies. Well, this one here: the provisional IRA members leafleting and election electioneering for the Sinn Féin reports of find. An independent report into uh, into paramilitary activity has found that the provisional IRA still exists but in much a reduced capacity still exists mm. i'm going to give you my take on that one yet again everything that i read in the newspaper sounds like it's already designed and smacks of the um the organized conspiracy call it whatever you want they did their job Okay, direct action is a way of acting like a fulcrum and lever. I use the term fulcrum and lever because those people who are high-ranking masons will know that fulcrum and lever are the two pillars you find in the Masonic Lodge, Jaguen and Boaz. In Hebrew, in, uh, in archaic Hebrew, it means fulcrum and lever. It's the pretext that you have a duality of nature in the, in those two pillars, two of the male phallic symbols, but the names, Jacaringham and Boaz, they were the pillars outside of the first temple um, in Jerusalem. And uh, that's when Solomon had an affinity with the Pharaoh's daughter to keep the secrets of what they are in the family. Um, but they were used as a fulcrum and lever, a hydraulic sand lever. Now, when you take the term in the Masonic context with regards to human society, direct action, terrorist groups, which is another, another name for them, they're usually under the, they usually used to be called under the banner direct action. Direct action is a mechanism that's used as a fulcrum lever to force the country that the direct action is being applied to into acquiescing to an overarching, otherwise hidden agenda. Now that they've done their job, they can go where they've been patting on the back. Well done. Congratulations. You've done your job. Now you you can be quiet. You're in a reduced capacity, but they still exist. And the reason why they still exist is because they never, ever let it be made known. Don't be, surpri don't be taken by surprise by these people. Because sometimes what they like to do is they like to lull people into a false sense of security by getting people to think that, OK, the IRA don't exist anymore, therefore they're not a trouble. And it's very, very plausible that if they want to, to make sure that if the nation that they used to be uh, attacking starts to slip from the agenda song sheet, to pull them out like a little card and say, you remember we still got them around, you know. We can still use them. Um, uh, and in fact, in many cases, they have done that in times past. And that's an interesting article. OK. Um, now I've got two articles here. Um, this one here is the, the next article I'm going to read. And then I shall get back to the list that I was doing yesterday. 
Okay. Um, UNESCO. UNESCO, for those people who know what UNESCO is, it's a UN uh, Economic Social uh, Committee of some form and description. UNESCO chief bashes draft text claiming Western Wall is a Muslim, a Muslim holy site. Now, I want to get into this a little bit. I'm going to have a little bit of a question. Apparently, I'm going to bring up uh, a website and I'm going to use Wikipedia for this one. So you excuse me whilst I'm floating around in Never Never Land. But I'm going to use Wikipedia for this one because I'm going to do a question. OK, this is one of those questions and answer sessions that you have. OK. Right, I'm just going to type in the Prophet Muhammad. Okay. Because I have a point I want to bring up on this one. Okay. Okay. Prophet Muhammad. Okay, the life of the Prophet Muhammad. Here you are. That's the one. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of a, a whiz here. Anybody but anybody who believes the lies that Islam tell needs to be waking up to the reality. Okay. Now, Wikipedia says here that the um, I'm only interested in the death of the Prophet Muhammad. Now, I'm not interested in everything that he did, just his death and what is required of Muslims with regards to their dead bodies. OK. Muhammad died. On the 8th of June, according to Wikipedia. And 622. In Medina. OK. And. Apparently was buried there. Now. I'm going to make a statement here with regards to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, the Golden Dome of the Rock Mosque. First of all, let's talk about Jerusalem as a bit of background here um, to get these spurious and erroneous facts straight. The Quran is not mentioned at all in Sorry, the Jerusalem is not mentioned in the Quran at all, although it is generally accepted as inferred. It is claimed that Jerusalem is the third most holy city for the Muslims, ranking under Mecca and Medina. Medina being the burial and death place of the Prophet Muhammad. Now, the Golden Dome of the Rock was erected in 682 or 83 AD, 50 years after the death of the Prophet. Why was it erected? Because the Muslims erroneously, deceitfully, untruthfully, and without any validation, any facts, any witness at all, claimed... That the, uh, that the Prophet Muhammad ascended up into heaven from the Temple Mount. Now that is an interesting question. According to Muslim tradition, when somebody dies, they have to be buried very, very quickly. Muslims and Jews are quite similar in that sense. They make sure that they get their, their, their dead ones respectfully and decently and tastefully dispatched into the ground as soon as they can, as quickly as they can. So here's the question I'm going to ask anybody who has a who who wants to think about this a little bit. If the Prophet Muhammad died in 622 AD or 623 AD and the Golden Dome of the Rock was erected because that was where the Prophet Muhammad ascended up into heaven at the time the Dome of the Rock was erected which was 683 
or 82 AD, what were they doing with the prophet's uh, body? Were they doing like that old Shakespeare one, dragging his casket or humping his bones through the neighbourhood? I wonder why it is that people never question Islam over the issue of the deceitfulness with regard to that story. And yet they're claiming that the Golden Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque were put there because they're put there in commemoration and in memorial of the ascended Prophet Muhammad from that Temple Mount site. Without any evidence. Uh, and now... It's not just as if they want to say that the Golden Dome of the Rock and the Alexia Mosque and the Temple Mount is, is, is now Muslim territory. They now want to push what little the Jews have of the first and second temple period temple on the Temple Mount area away from that area. Now that wall that they go to, the Western Wall, the Kotan, the Kotel, the Wailing Wall, that's approximately about a hundred yards from side to side, approximately, maybe a little, little less. It is divided. For anybody who doesn't know it, it is divided into two sections. You have one third for the women and two third for the men. This is the only part the Jews have that's left of the Temple One period and the Temple Two period, where the original Temple erected by Solomon which was destroyed by the Babylonians and uh, under the hand of Nebuchadnezzar and the Assyrians. And then uh, then you got the second temple period that was built uh, as a direct result of, of the of the Syrian decree that it was OK for the Jews to return from Babylon back to uh, to Israel, back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And that was set by Cyrus and the decree was issued by the king of Babylon at the time. and said, OK, you go back and build. So they built that and then it was destroyed in 70 AD. That's the actual history that's been proven. That's been documented. By the way, anybody who disputes the Second Temple period, Josephus, he has made enormous amount of remarks about that one. But for a period of the 19th century, so the diaspora, since the Jews were driven out of the land by either the Romans, uh, uh, the Phoenicians, the, uh, the, the Palestinians, the Arabs, or, or anybody else, that land went uncultivated uncultivated by it by those people who remained there um, uh, there was a scottish preacher martin murray mcshay when he wrote about what a, what jerusalem looked like when he went to visit jerusalem at the turn of the century he said it was like a desolate wasteland a heap a rubbish ruinous heap completely unloved uncared for Mark Twain said it had become mournful, like a city lying in sackcloth and ashes when he visited it. So here we have um, a non-indigenous people who are, no, who, who are essentially nomadic in, 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 in application, believing in the Prophet Muhammad, who are Islamic in belief, but essentially are a Bedouin, which are nomadic. They move from one place to another. We're not really looking after the place, not really cultivating the place, not planting down crops, just moving sheep from one place, cattle from one place to another, watering the ca camels, roaming the place over the Bedouin uh, badlands that, you call, that are called the Judean wilderness. Unloved. Unloved. 1948. Uh, Israel was reborn as a, uh, as a nation. It was reborn. Not born, reborn. The Jews were starting to return in repeated waves of Ali and Olim back into Israel. Then they started to cultivate the land and look after the land and, and nurture it. And suddenly Israel is now becoming a land that can be lived on, worked, cultivated, developed. Since 1948 and the rebirth of the nation state of Israel, Israel has enjoyed unprecedented growth, unprecedented in infrastructure. And in just the short uh, 67 years that it's been in existence, you will be absolutely shatteredly shocked and absolutely outstandingly shocked and staggeringly shocked. I, I can't think of words like that enough to say 
the, um, the, 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 the growth that's happened in Israel is literally unprecedented. Now, America is a nation that's approximately 250 to 300 years old. It has risen like the former colonies of Australia, New Zealand, in a similar matter, but it's in a similar manner over a period of time of approximately 250 to 300 years. What Israel has enjoyed since 1948 has been uh, uh, has never been seen before. Never been seen before. And Israel, apparently, as a nation, is now number one startup capital in the Middle East. More businesses are now starting up in Israel than a lot of than, than there are in the majority of the European uh, 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 nations that surround the Mediterranean. So, with that in mind, the Jews only have a small little portion of the old city of Jerusalem, of the old temple, to go to. That's called the Kotel, the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall. It's the only part they've got. Jewish people are not allowed, although they have people have been trying to make ways to allow them to get up there. And if they do go up on the Temple Mount, they've got to go up there accompanied by police and IDF soldiers. But generally speaking, as per as per the arrangement, uh, because the Temple Mount is administered by Jordanian authority, not by Palestinian authority. Make that uh, get that in your head. It's administered by uh, by Jordanian authority. With the tacit approval that the IDF soldiers and the Israeli police are allowed there just to supervise and keep the peace. But Jews are not allowed there. There have been some Jews going up there and it's caused an awful ruckus. And this is part of the tensions that are going on. But generally speaking, Jews are not allowed on the Temple Mount. As per se, the general gist is that they're not allowed. Christians are other visitors, other tourists. Yes, but if you're a Jew, especially if you're wearing a kippah. No, 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 no. Now, you get UNESCO... The chief is bashing a, a, a draft text claiming that the Western Wall is a Muslim holy site. Now you can tell that UN obviously have an agenda. Well, the UN is actually a pocket organisation of the Jesuits and the Church of Rome. And, I am, and I've spoken and clearly labelled this out um, or, or, or in one of my other previous broadcasts. And, and I will do a detailed pricey of that uh, in another upcoming programme when I'm when I've got the full facts uh, organised. Islam was created by the Church of Rome. And if the Church of Rome created Islam, and the Church of Rome has the, the UN in its pocket, and the UN is just but a perfunctory organ, organ of the Jesuits and the Church of Rome, then it is not surprising the UN want to squeeze the Jews even away from the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall, by claiming it to be a Muslim holy site without any validation. It's just another case of anti-Semitic thinking, anti-Semitic rhetoric, putting and piling on the pressure to get Israel to acquiesce to the, uh, to the two-state solution. Hello, how can you have a two-state two solution? How can you have a two-state solution... When you're thinking about a bunch of people who believe in a book that tells them they're going to kill people. Oh yeah, that's what the Quran teaches. That's what the Quran teaches. So how can you have a two-state solution making friends with a rattlesnake? Exactly. Yes. Um, and here's another one. And it's yet again, this one comes from my favourite Israeli bureau. This is from the I-24 bureau based out of Jaffa. Well, I did a, I did a, I did an article on its uh, lead uh, jur journalist uh, Lucy Harish. This one is the far right leader goes on trial for inciting hatred. Now, yet again, these articles are the articles on uh, these articles are articles uh, to do with, of course, obviously the far right being the neo Nazi party, neo Nazi. Um, how can you have a neo Nazi party when the Nazi party never went away? Can anybody say neo-Nazi with and keep a straight face? Can anybody say that? When you've got people, when you've got people who have who who have had an unchained, uh, an unbroken chain of a belief system that goes right back to the fascist socialist Fabian system that was concocted during World War One and developed to its full fruition in World War Two. 
and people still hold to that ideology in a modern time, how can that be described as neo-Nazi or neo-fascist when it's actually a continuation of the same policies by other means? Do you hear that? It's a continuation of the same policy by other means. These people. The far right uh, leader goes on a trial for inciting hatred. hatred. Marie Le Pen, a leader of France's far right, far right National Front, went on trial Tuesday for charges on, on inciting hatred after uh, comparing Muslim street preachers on the Nazi occupation. 41-year-old uh, uh, who has won a string of election successes after working to soften the image of uh, her of her party, appeared in court in the central city of Lyon over the comments she made whilst make uh, whilst campaigning to take over the leadership of the party from her father five years ago. You know, look, I I this is what I believe. Okay, I don't believe. I do not believe that you need to make statements uh, that incite and stir people's deeds up to blood. All you need to do is put their belief system into an investigative system uh, and to examine whether its belief system stacks up against the basic modicum of human rights. Just the basic modicum. Now, I, I can I, I could go one step further as a Bible believer. I could say, well, actually, you take anybody else's by uh, any anybody else's belief system and measure them against God's word. Well, I know full well that they won't stack up. Nothing stacks up to God's word. I know that people will say that there are things that stack up to God's word and that, and can actually supersede God's word in a lot of ways. Mm, well, I, t I, I I cite, for instance, one of the most common ones that's used in the secular education is evolution. But uh, that's for another show, for another time. But to actually put uh, to actually put that into the context and say, well, okay, we're just going to attack another race because we don't like them. Now that's not the way it's supposed to work. What you do is you say, well, let's have a look, have a look at Islam and make it, and put it into the public debate, the public arena. And put a debate in the public forum so that, the, so that the entire merits and detriments of that belief system can be examined. And once it can be established, then you put it under scrutiny. Then you can then say, that is a belief system that doesn't work. But to just turn around and say, okay, I think it is wrong. I think there are ways to, uh, and intelligent ways to to deal with the conflicts that human beings have unfortunately sometimes those ways may not necessarily be the the right ways anyway well that's the end of today's news uh, articles now i'm going to get into this list that i was uh, doing a glossary of terms for the new world order as i've said the reason why i'm doing this list is because unfortunately there are some people who are getting involved in this alternative history research and probably know very little about the New World Order. I've heard of these things. So I'm making it easy. It's like a, um, a New World Order for dummies. So I'll get into this list. So yesterday I did 12 items. Today I'm going to be doing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 items. A very short and that's the list. It's just a very quick page. Okay, right, and and it's also done in, in in it's also done in alphabetical order. So for those people who want to watch my show uh, in its repeat uh, uh, broadcast, that is when it's uploaded uh, to YouTube, and you want to watch uh, uh, my YouTube, you can look at the comments. So you can actually see this, and when I finish this, you'll actually have a list that you can cut and paste, put them onto a Word document, and then print them and send them around, post them around. I got the information free. So I'm giving it for free, okay? I don't know whether it'll cost me anything. Maybe my life. Maybe I'll say something in this list that'll upset somebody. I don't know, but I'm enjoying this. Right, so next one. Okay, start. so we're starting page two on this one. Next one is the, the first one on this, uh, on this list for today is the American River Heritage Program. And I also said, when I'm reading this, if I make very little comments, it's because I consider that that particular... Um, 
uh, term, uh, organization, person, event, or whatever. It's low key event. Uh, if they, if you make, if you hear, see me, or hear me making huge comments about something, it is because it is quite significant and it influences people on a global scale and actually is quite a prominent issue. So, and I know something about it. Okay. If I don't know anything about it, I'll shut, I'll, I'll shut myself up. Okay. But if I do know something about it, I will share with, with what I know. And that's as simple as that. American River Heritage Program, a program to develop a corridor of federal protection and regulation to preserve and restore the river basin area of uh, any river that is declared a historical river heritage site. It is, the, it is neither a law or, or even a treaty, but is uh, proposed by a mere bureaucratic decree. However, uh, the worst danger is that it gives federal authority over all adja adjacent tributaries and to the connected water uh, watersheds. Um, the term restore is not defined and if past regulations are any indication, it will mean uh, to return the land back to the pre-human habitation. If they should declare any part of the Mississippi such, it would virtually mean that over 50% of the United States will be under federal authority and they will uh, and they will be able to make you leave if they want. Now I've heard uh, as an adjunct to this that FEMA and the US federal government have have now started to implement laws uh, whereby it is actually now illegal to go hunting and living off the land, off grid uh, and um, existing and traversing in a semi-permanent way through some of the national parks of the United States of America. This is quite similar. And basically what it really means is that if anybody uh, knows anything about big government and big government being what it is, what it means is that if big government take over, it means that they can squeeze the individual out of the picture because they do not want people to live off the grid. They don't want people to live off the land. They don't want people uh, uh, to, to live free and enjoy the air free that, that, that God has given them uh, to grow crops uh, for themselves uh, and to not have to pay, as they euphemistically call it, and it's so-called in the United States, the big man. I don't want that happening. And that's a bit of a crying shame because the big man wants to muscle into everybody's life. And human beings, if left to their own devices and given God's law, will actually be very prosperous, will be very prosperous indeed. But somehow what has happened is that God's law has been supplanted by man's law. And now they're implementing policies. And now we have a situation where by even policies are treated as if they're law, when in fact they're not law, they're just policies. Uh, the government may say, OK, if we have a policy, a policy of making sure that people can only walk down one side of the street one direction on one day. That's a hypothetical case, of course. And it's a ludicrous version, a ludicrous hypothetical case. But if they did that, it's a policy. There's no law. It's not written. It's not a statute. It's not, part, it's not put on a legislative book and they can't quote it in a court of law. But a policy is something that can be equally enforced by, by, by so-called law enforcement officers. Because most people will say, well, OK, if, the law, if you're enforcing a law, I'm assuming that, that law is a law and not a policy. Policy, by the way, that's where we get the word politics from. Politics is derived from an adjunct of the word policy. To implement policy. Got it? To implement policy. Not to enforce law. Politics. Okay. Right, the next one is the Anadahak Incorporated. That is spelled A-N-A-D-H-A-C Incorporated. A private firm that develops the biometric identity system, biometric security devices basically refer to the use of digitization of unique biological uh, uh, 
uh, features, vectors like fingerprints, retinal scans, DNA and voice prints to confirm the identity uh, of the user or holder of a card or pass key. Anybody but anybody will now know. Okay. The iPhone uh, 5S and upward. The new, uh, uh, the new iPads. Um, I originally had one. It was a Hewlett Packard PDA that had a fingerprint reader on it. I got it because I thought it was very, very sexy to have a fingerprint reader. I thought, oh yeah, I like that one. Um, people tend to think, oh, I like that one because I can do that and that's me. Unfortunately, the Adahec uh, Incorporation, which is a sub-corporation of the NSA, whose job was to develop these biometric devices, actually have developed these biometric devices so that they can tag you. Fingerprint? Uh, oh, yeah. You are a clean skin. You decide to commit. Now, I'm going to talk about this in terms of a, a, a supposed brand new criminal. Now, a brand new criminal, a person who's just started out in the career, a career criminal world. They call him in certain uh, uh, communities a clean skin. In other words, there's no file on him. He has no uh, fingerprints. He has no mug shots. He has no DNA. There's nothing. This is a brand new crime. They're coming up against a brand new criminal. They've, it's never been vectored or, or, or and never been configured on their books. Called a clean skin. In the old days, a clean skin, they would have to wait until that criminal has committed a, a second crime. Then they've got the, the, the fingerprints or the DNA or, or material evidence on that crime on his, uh, on that, from the crime scene of that criminal on his first crime. Now he's committed another crime. They've got, the, uh, they've got a cross match. They say, OK, well, we've got fingerprints in match that other crime. Then they're linking two crimes. And now they know got a, they've got a career criminal. Now, with a career criminal, what it means is it means that then they can develop a profile. Um, and then when they do eventually catch the criminal through using other investigative, investigatory means, they catch the criminal, he's taken into the police cell, he's then tagged, fingerprinted, photographed, mugshot, DNA, okay, then they can match that with any known cases they've got where that those those three forms of data have been uh, extracted. Then they can say that you did that. Now, that's called a clean skin. Everybody knows that. Got that? Everybody knows that's how it works in the criminal fraternity. Now, if you're not a criminal, though, uh, you'll think, OK, I've got a nice smartphone. Now, I've got a smartphone. I've got a fingerprint device on it. Yes, I switched mine off. Um... I've got a smartphone. People have got smartphones. Got fingerprint. Your fingerprint and a picture of that particular finger that you use has been uploaded and a database uh, of that has been put in this company. It has then been sent through joint JTAX, Joint Intelligence Corps, and the Echelon system that I was referring to in my previous broadcast on a shared database system. What they are doing, actually, ultimately, is building a massive database of biometric profiling on every citizen. Now, generally speaking, yes, your cell phone can track you where you are. That's true. And generally, uh, people are worried about the civil liberties of the idea that you can be tracked by your cell phone. I don't really have any problems with the idea that the cell phone can track you. I understand that that can happen and I understand that that is done. I don't have any problems with that and the reason why is because of the statement that most people make, and particularly those who support the law enforcement community, and, and, and that is, well, you have nothing to worry about if you've got nothing to hide, if you've done nothing wrong. Well, that's true. If you've got nothing uh, to hide, you've got nothing wrong, you've done nothing wrong. You should be not worried about any of this. That's true. That is the general gist. And it's for that reason that I will approach this issue in this manner when I say I've got no problems with the tracking of individuals. As long as it remains at that level. The problem is, is when you start tracking individuals 
and you are recording what they're watching on their mobile devices and you're starting to get a profile of what they believe and then you will make a policy politics policy get the picture that you will start to make it offensive to believe a certain thing now that is called euphemistically the thought police to direct the thoughts that's where the word government comes from govern to govern meant a der derivative of mental of the mind to govern the mind now as I've said I have no problem with the cell phone or any other mobile device being used to track you it is when it's used as a device in the background to monitor what you believe and then at a later date determine that what you believe is offensive to three thinking a, sta a, 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 a society okay that's when it gets dangerous it's when they implement the thought police policies that are underpinned by the supporting acts of the biometrics and the tracking and the tracing of your cell phone and your biological data but anyway that's what this company does so it's a subsidiary of the NSA this company and they and this NSA has a, a lot of subsidiary companies that do all this kind of stuff now the next one is the ANC everybody knows this from previous uh, previous history African National Conf uh, Congress is in fact a communist revolutionary front and by the way um, uh, it has been it has been considerably documented that uh, the finances uh, for the ANC came from uh, from uh, Eastern Europe and from Russia and it is alleged that some of the leaders in the ANC were actual communist agents okay uh, my my take on on South African history is somewhat different and one day I will get into that and give you a, 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 a little a share a little item with you on that one okay next item and Andio, A N D A Y O incident. On January the 25th, 1995, a research missile, missile was launched from the Norwegian island of Andio. Its purpose was uh, to study the climate and environment of the polar ice caps. Despite being told in advance of the launch, uh, it nearly triggered a nuclear war. Russia, uh, Russian military uh, uh, doubted that it was a research missile and came within a whisker of launching uh, a nuclear response towards the West. Uh, this, is, uh, this all happened in an environment in which the Cold War uh, is over and Russia is our friend. Yet we are now letting... Uh, thousands on thousands of Russian troops to be stationed in America right now and that actually is true right now in the last in the last three years alone uh, and Russian and uh, Russian troops Eastern Russian, Russian troops have been stationed in the US and in fact I believe that was a report uh, yesterday that um, uh, that the US has allowed Russian uh, jets to uh, to do patrolling over America and hang on I'm I'm having I'm having a, yet again another knee-jerk naive reaction on this one uh, now that uh, we now that we're all uh, friends again I feel like quoting um, Boosie Barley Blair from the Russia house now that we're all friends again we're all supposed to roll over and play a nice little doggy uh, all the more to sp uh, to spy the living daylights out of them de uh, uh, declares uh, an uh, his his counterpart, his op opponent there. I am getting real strange vibes with this one. I mean, I really am getting strange vibes. The idea that um, Russia is allowed to have troops in America, and that's been documented. To, uh, that now, yesterday, there was an article that uh, that the U.S. Uh, Congress has said that it's okay for Russians to fly their jets over America doing surveillance gathering operations. I, th I think that I'm looking at a world in which is not what it appears to be for me. 
I'm going to make the statement that David Icke makes on this one. The This world is run by unimaginably sick individuals and the chasm between what we've been told is happening and what is actually happening is enormous. And this sounds to me that this is one of those cases. By the way, it's not, it's, it's not uncommon. Um, I believe that there has been since the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was one of them, where we, where the, in those days in the Cold War, for those people who don't know much about how it worked in the Cold War, uh, what you have in the Cold War is uh, you had a clock, and the 12 o'clock midnight was, it's over. It's a global thermonuclear war. Uh, everybody's killing each other, and that's when MAD kicks in. Uh, MAD stands for Mutually Assured Destruction, for those people who don't know the lingo and the language and um during the mad uh, era of the cold war um apparently uh, there were about uh, seven or eight times that the doomsday clock was reading uh, five to twelve the cuban missile crisis being the closest on the books that i remember not that i was born then i was born in 1961 so i live vicariously from other people's memory of that event and uh and the cuban missile crisis put the doomsday clock at i think it was uh uh two or three minutes to 12 midnight well seven or eight times we've been close to this so this is one of those events where you say oh my goodness we yeah there yeah, i'm sorry to say it happens and in an era when we're supposed to be friends no, 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 no. Remember what I just said about the about the direct action. They are cards that if they want to, they will pull them out if a nation that they were used against is not towing the line. Well, the Cold War can be used on the global community if the global community aren't towing the line. They have ways of keeping people compliant to their wishes. Okay? Very interesting world we live in. Very interesting world. Okay, the next one. Angel Fire. Okay. Angel Fire, a resort located in New Mexico that was once owned by Dan Lassiter. Dan regularly flew Bill Clinton and friends there for drug parties and sex orgies. And one trip, uh, one young girl, probably a minor, overdosed and died. They have gone to great lengths to cover it up and protect uh, Clinton. Now, I'm here to say that it's probable that the Monica Lewinsky affair occurred as a direct result um, of uh, an attempt to actually uh, disguise uh, what Bill Clinton had done. Probably. I can't be sure about that, but probably. I know that he got away scot free with that one, and there have been people who have done documentaries, and there are documentaries on YouTube that describe and lay out exactly what happened in Mina. So I'm not an, a nut on this one. Okay, uh, they've had uh, pilots have been killed as a result of knowing too much about that. There have been people who are involved in that who are no longer with us. Uh, my dearest friend that I had. Uh, who I knew for 21 years, an elderly man who passed away in my company. It was an honour to know him, Kevin O'Neill, which all these shows I'm, I'm dedicating to, by the way. He had, a fa he had a wonderful expression when dealing with people who have to go. He said, they'll have to go and they will not be back next week. That's, an, that's a good expression. They will have to go and they will not be back next week. Okay, they will not be back next week. So if you know too much, you will have to go and you will not be back next week. So don't be surprised if I tread on some people's toes with this broadcast. OK. By the way, with the Bill Clinton affair, that, uh, that's a show I'd like to do one on, actually, um, to cover that in, fair, in, in, in a fair detail. And these shows that I'm doing, as I said, they're in the beta testing stage. So they're kind of like in the process of developing its format. I'm developing my screen persona and a lot of things. And I'm wondering whether or not I have enough stories to make it run. And sometimes I may not and may not let it run. But nevertheless, we'll go on. OK, angels, spiritual beings. This one's the next one on the list. Angels, spiritual beings created uh, for the purpose of serving God. And many people have 
uh, considered extraterrestrial, uh, extraterrestrials, ascended masters and spiritual adepts to be angels. Yet there are two kinds of angel, be angelic beings uh, that, are dis uh, that are described in the Bible. I'm using the Bible as a reference, nothing else. Those who uh, who remained loyal to God uh, and those who uh, which have rebelled and are rebe uh, the rebellious or fallen angels are called demons, foul spirits, uh, uh, and um, and watchers. It is essential to the spiritual warfare to understand that the demons will counterfeit themselves as aliens, ghosts, ancient masters or even angels of God, in order to deceive mankind. Testing every spirit with the word of God is necessary. I'm a Bible believer, so I'll go along with that one. Some people will have a different version on that, but I do believe that everything needs to be tested. And Well, we have to decide what the ruler's going to be. You, um, uh, you go out, I'll show you a ruler. Here's one. Here's a ruler. Everybody's got one. Everybody uses them. Mine's a metal one. When you want to measure something, you've got to have something to measure it by. Wake up. I'm not saying any more about that. You have to decide where the standard is. Next one, antioxidants, foods and vitamins, which neutralize free radicals. Free radicals are the excesses uh, of ravenous oxygen molecules missing uh, 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 an electron which damages other molecules. To replace uh, that electron, antioxidants are essential to provide extra electrons. By the way, antioxidants are also used in the process of, um, of by the way, of getting rid of the free radicals in actually helping heal the body against um, the excesses of a modern fat-filled Western lifestyle. Yeah. Okay. Right. The next one. ALP. American Protective Lead. Was a volunteer auxiliary of the pre-FBI bio um, history. They were thugs and vigilantes who operated without legal authority. Well, you see, that's interesting. Um, if, you, if you read the history of... Um, the Metropolitan Police and how the uh, the Metropolitan Police was set up. It was set up by Robert Peel. They call them Peelers, Bow Street Runners, um, Coppers. By the way, as a slight sideline to that, do, uh, for anybody who wants to know where the word copper comes from, when you say copper, that's a cop. It actually is to do with a copper badge. It's to do with the, met the metal their badge was made. They've got a badge, it's a copper badge, you're a cop. Okay. But it's interesting that this uh, a, uh, a APL... Uh, essentially, were, uh, as a precursor to the FBI, they used thugs. Well, the, the forerunner of most modern police forces, if you go back to the 18th century, they used thugs because their, their, their motto was to send a criminal to catch a criminal. A civilian who's a well-behaved citizen won't know the kind of circles and the kind of mentality and the kind of tactics used by criminals to, uh, to elude capture. So what you have to do... And she have to go and find a criminal body and recruit from the criminal body and use the criminal body to go and catch criminals. Send a criminal to catch a criminal. And unfortunately, in that process, you tend to end up um, uh, uh, corrupting the very organ that is set up to actually catch the criminal. So you kind of ask uh, who's serving who. Who is corrupting who? Um, yet again, it goes back to that same, that same, uh, uh, the same uh, uh, um, reasoned uh, remark I made in my previous broadcast of yesterday. When you have, uh, a, when you have a, a, a religious leader, a Baptist minister who is a congressman, and you have you and you believe in separation of church and state, and when you believe in separation of church and state. Uh, you have a Baptist minister who's a congressman. Now, is his belief serving his politics or is his politics serving his belief? Well, it's a similar situation where you have a criminal who's been recruited by a law enforcement body to catch a criminal. Is that criminal going to corrupt the law enforcement body that recruited him in order to catch a criminal? And is corruption going to seek in? Well, actually, inevitably, it does happen. Any person with 
do your thinking, you'd know that that happens. It's quite a reasonable thing to deduce that it actually has been going on for quite some time and for quite a long time. Okay. Right, the next one is Area 51. Now, I'm going to be covering Area 51. Most people know about Area 51. I've got some ideas about Area 51, and, I'll do, and I'd like to do a show on that um, uh, at some stage. Obviously, I'm going to be looking at uh, some subjects which I can cover in this show. I'm going to see if I can get through them. Okay, the next one is Arianism. A-R-I-A-N-ism. I-S-M. Uh, an early Christian belief that was condemned by the church. It was the error if it uh, it was in error if it did indeed lessen the divinity of Christ. But the history is written by the victor, Arian, Arians, uh, Arians. Uh, I've been respectfully reminded now. I had a conversation with Arians also kept all the laws, including the the Shabbats, and condemned the idolatry and Mary worship. Uh, uh, Their views on the Trinity have been misunderstood. Now, I'm here to say this now, okay? Um, The Aryan debate, um, I would like to get into at a later date because it's quite an extensive one for for you Bible believers out there who are watching my show. The Aryan debate went on for quite some time. It's debating the issue of the divinity of Yeshua, the divinity of Jesus Christ. And they were, deba- they were debating, of course, the nature of the Trinity or Triunity and the guiltless or sinlessness of Mary. Now, first of all, I will tell you that from what I've read of the scriptures, uh, in Matthew, it shows Mary going up to the temple with two turtle doves in accordance with the Leviticus and Deuteronomy law. In other words, if she's carrying two turtle doves up to the temple to sacrifice them, she is acknowledging she is with sin. Because if you don't have sin, you wouldn't do that. Okay? So we can deal with that one easily. And for you Roman Catholics out there who might be listening, that's an issue that you will have to look at. And you find it in Matthew. Go and find it in Matthew. It's in the book of Matthew. Okay. Now, with regards to the issue of the Trinity, I do not believe in the word Trinity or the word triunity. I believe that the word that's closest to it in the scriptures is called the Godhead. And all that means is the divine an angel sent by God is divine. The Ruach Kaddush given by God is divine. The, bapti- uh, the, the, the mikvah waters uh, that are used for, cl- uh, for cleansing is, a divine, is an act of the divine. The word, the written word, divine. Written with his finger, the Ten Commandments, divine. Uh, uh, Yahweh, Jehovah's call for man to repent and be obedient is divine it's of the divinity it's of the divine Uh, and I think that the problem is that a lot of Bible believers have is that they tend to use um, non-biblical words to describe biblical concepts and then they get themselves into an awful lot of theological hot water I believe that the word Godhead is sufficient enough for me why would I want to make any more of it than it actually is? And especially to jump into this notion of using Babylonian constructs to try to explain away what the scriptures are talking about is, is beyond me. Beyond me. Okay. Um, okay. Arkansas. Uh, now we've got into Arkansas. This is connected to Bill Clinton. Arkansas. This is about... For you who I want to know how it's written, I'll be writing this out. Arkansas, the term that is now being used uh, as a reference to all the dead bodies surrounding Bill Clinton. It seems that a great number of Bill's associates or those with intimate knowledge of Bill Clinton's affairs are ending up dead under mysterious circumstances. Suicide, accidental death being the most common. Yet again, 
we're getting into Bill Clinton territory, Arkansas. When he was governor of Arkansas, he signed memorandums. Um, uh, and that was for the purpose of C-130 transporter planes going south with weapons coming no uh, north with drugs. Drugs for guns. Does that sound familiar to you? Have you seen that story before? The Iran-Contra affair. Um, Air America. By the way, the, as, a as, as, as an adjunct to that, um, a side issue... That's been one of the reasons why there's been this hotly, hotly, hotly t contested debate on the Hill over the issue of missing in action from Nam. Apparently it's been a, a claimed, allegedly claimed, that a lot of these missing in action soldiers from Vietnam are actually now working for Uncle Sam in a very interesting, lucrative, invisible business called um, the drug trade. Hmm from the Golden Triangle. One will never know. Mysteries and mysteries, eh? Okay, next one is Aspen Institute, the new age think tank that is involved with mind control and social engineering. Secular humanism is to become the ultimate faith uh, and solution to all the international problems. Sounds very similar to um, an, uh, 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 to socialist Fabian, Fabian socialism. The founders were well no, well no, well connected to the Tavistock Institute. Now, mind control. Um, yet again, government mind control, government mind control. I'm going to be getting into mind control uh, at a later date. Um, I will be writing up notes on things that I will be reviewing these subjects that I'm dealing with because I'm just deal giving you the, 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 essentially a glossary of terms and a little sentence of what it means. Because this rabbit hole called the New World Order and what has been delivered to mankind as uh, our form of existence and our former paymasters and now our former masters lording it over us with all the technocracy that they can throw at us have landed us in a very serious case of hot water. And, uh, and 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 these issues are the issues which are now at the forefront of most people who are concerned. And if you were to ask me, oh, well, we've got all these big problems. Which one is the best one to be dealing with? Well, um, you have to decide whether you're going to go for the roots or the fruits. Now, a person standing with a tin cup, an old tin cup, getting money, raising money for the Siemens mission because they're looking for the opportunity to feed the seamen uh, uh, that are coming off the boats in the Merchant Navy, and we're talking about a period of time way back in the, the 40s and 50s, that's the fruits. Well, that is the fruits, yeah, I guess so. Today we go on the high street and we'll find loads of people with charity boxes raising money for charities. A lot of these charities are dealing with the fruits. They're trying to solve the fruits, but they're not dealing with the roots that are causing the problem. Well, these uh, glossary of terms that I'm giving you are essentially some of the fruits that have been borne out by this evil poisonous tree called the New World Order. And I'm describing them. Because people do need to know what they are. People do need to see what they are. And then they need to know where to do research on this. And I will be posting these on my uh, YouTube upload of this program. Okay? <coughs> <coughs> But the Aspen Institute is a new age think tank. Yeah, uh, Secular humanism, social engineering. These can all be programs. And I will make programs on each of these at a later date, more in depth and go in and then explain to you how these work. Apotheosis, the definition of, of rulers or a kind of God. The Pope is said to be a God in the flesh and the Illuminati uh, intend to place their pontiff on the throne as God also and it quotes a passage of scripture and I believe that passage of scripture needs to be examined correctly I think it's erroneously placed for this one but the passage of scripture they use for this one is uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 through to 4 I'd like to do my take on that one from the way I was taught and you'd be really interesting to see how that's borne out <clears throat> and the last one for the list for the day is Asmodeus Rank 
It represents only the middle management position within the Illuminati hierarchy, but the high ranking within the Satanic hierarchy. Okay. These are just simply the buzzwords of the New World Order. Okay. Glossary of terms. I've done uh, this page, uh, and there are doubtless to say there's about 24 of these to do, so we can do 24 programs on this, and by that time, you will know what these are. And as I've said, I'll be posting links on this so you can find out what these are. I'll give you some links and web pages so you can kickstart your own research into this because it because it's really fascinating. It's so fascinating, and and it's and it gives an endless endless entertainment for those people who are into examining how human history really works as opposed to how it's we're told it's worked. It is now uh, about nine twenty. Uh, I've been going at this broadcast since 8 o'clock. This is longer than I anticipated, but I'm okay because I give myself two hours and usually I end up doing only an hour. But I was glad and I'm happy that I've actually now done an extra 20 minutes on what I, what I thought I would do as opposed to running, you, sh running short by uh, 40 minutes, which you're expecting from me. Uh, as I've said, the show is in uh, its beta testing stage. I've enjoyed myself. I'm your host, David C. And this is saying good night, God bless, and sweet dreams, wherever you are. <laughs>